Okay, hi everyone. Uh, this is certainly different to how I thought I'd be delivering this, but I guess we weren't too surprised when we finished the class um, Wednesday two weeks ago and now we find ourselves here today. Nonetheless, I hope you're all well and of course your own health and well-being, physical and mental, and that of your families of course comes before, before any of this. Uh, my goal is to get you through this module of course, I'm going to deliver this module as intended, um, just not in person. And with that in mind, what I'm really going to try to do for the next couple of weeks is to pare this down to exactly what you need to get through this course. Um, and what I mean by that is, where possible, we'll try and avoid any sort of digressions. Uh, I'll try and stay on point. And I've certainly cut it down so that there'll be no overlapping from week to week. Um, each one of these will be contained. If you're listening at the scheduled time, uh, it's certainly a good idea to try and keep it as normal as possible in terms of timetabling. But as you know, if you're watching this, you know, obviously, uh, these videos are available online at any time. So uh, from now till the end of the course, I will do my best to upload the videos in time. They will always be uploaded before the 4 p.m. time slot on a Wednesday. And you can watch them anytime you want. At a minimum, as ever, I would suggest the best way to treat these is to do the reading first and then to come back and to use the lecture as sort of a supporting uh, a, a supporting resource for the reading either to sort of explain or develop concepts or themes present in the readings or to talk through practical examples and this week is really the last week of sort of core theory that we'll be focusing on the rest of the course deals very much with sort of the social or the socioeconomics of climate change and climate transition if you like and of course, as we know, the events of the last um, three months have brought up all sorts of changes. One of the features of this module is that I have to redesign it every year because things are moving so fast with respect to climate change. And now we've got a whole host of changes to deal with uh, right here as well. Immediate changes um, that, of course, have environmental origins and environmental and human consequences. And of course, social causes as well. So what today is going to deal with uh, is is really about the relationship between the ecological and the social. And it's something that's taken quite a lot of time uh, for many theorists for many, many years. We've looked at traces of this already in classical environmental social theory. And some of the people that we're now going to revisit, we looked at them in terms of their philosophies of nature and society in week two. And this week we're going to look at them in terms of how they thought about environment and society um, as systems, either as separate systems or as interrelated systems. And as we know all too well, as the climate debates of the last, uh, particularly the last five years, but really the last decade, and if you want to be pedantic about it, going back to the 1950s and 60s, um, we have known, of course, that there is a profound uh, relationship between economy, ecology and society. Uh, one of the watchwords or slogans, of course, of the recent wave of climate strikes is system change, not climate change. We know that our socioeconomic systems are connected with or causative of uh, climate change. Our industrial system drives it, our modes of consumption, our social organization defines um, and drives climate change. And it's where most social movements are focusing their efforts on system change. So we want to talk today about what we actually mean by that notion of system. And although we're thinking of, and again, sociology, as I said, is fundamentally the science of social collective behavior. We live in societies and societies are systems. And it's important that we understand what we mean by a system. Now, the concept has a history. And what I'm going to try to do in this session, at least, is to trace some of that history out for you and um, to see where the concept of system has come from, how it's changed over the years, how it's been incorporated by environmental thinkers and how ecologists have ultimately ended up contributing to the debate on the relationship between um, between society and environment or society and ecology. So what I'm going to start with is over the course of the 20th century um, our thinking on the relationship between social and ecological systems um, has evolved. In the past we tended to think of these very much as separate entities and we saw some of this as I said in week two and sort of the separatist philosophies of nature and society um, of some of the classical social theorists. So the trends in the last sort of three Sorry, um, the trend over the last century really has been the progressive incorporation uh, of society and ecology into a unified body of theory. Uh, 
In other words, our thinking on the relationship between these has evolved to a point where now we recognize the fundamental interconnectedness of the social and the ecological. And so we want to trace the history of that uh, in this session today. What I want to start with is a quick overview of um, some of the basics of what we mean by a system and then we'll talk a little bit about the history of systems theory and sociology. And in reference to Swedberg's uh, 2014 book on the use of theory in sociology, um, he's got quite a nice way of kind of compartmentalizing the different aspects of theory and why we actually need theory in the first place. The most important reason that we need theory is that it allows us to carry out scientific analysis by giving us a common vocabulary. Um, it's pretty much impossible to build a coherent body of scientific knowledge unless we have a common vocabulary and unless we have clarity that we're all talking about the same the same things. So one of the most basic features of social theory is the notion of concepts. Concepts are simply working definitions of very specific social phenomena. You've already studied research methods, most of you at some point, and you will have looked at the process of conceptualization. And this is where, um, as researchers, we define the thing it is that we're investigating. We can't investigate something unless we know what it is, how to identify it. Um, if we see it in practice, how do we know sort of what it is? And some of these, are, in sociology at least, are very diffuse. Um, for example, things like discrimination. We can probably define loosely what we mean by discrimination, but to observe it in practice, to define it, would be a lot more difficult. We need a consistent definition to point us towards sort of what to look for in our studies. And concepts work this way as well with respect to the study of social systems. Um, the concept system is a concept, social is a concept. Some of the ones that you're probably more familiar with are things like the concept of social class. So we know that we can, sociologists, economic sociologists tend to divide um, societies on the basis of means, often income or employment or something like that, and we call that, that hierarchy social class. Uh, different sorts of concepts that we've looked at in the course would be things like capitalism, feudalism, and so on. And again, there's often disagreement about these. People disagree on what the essential features of capitalism actually are. For some, it's simply the presence of a cash economy. For others, it's particular ways of organizing work. For others, it's things to do with you know, what they might call the social relations of production, so how workers relate to employers and so on, and sort of wider relationships between capital and labor, that sort of thing. So concepts are simply definitions. Um, what do we mean by class? We can define it as X, Y, and Z. What do we mean by family? We can define family as in several different ways. A family might be a nuclear family, an extended family, and so on. And in order to carry out effective research, we also need to understand how things relate to each other. So much of what we do in sociology is premised on the discovery or the investigation of relations between different properties, different social properties. So in the study of inequality, for example, one of the things that sociologists have spent quite a long time studying is the relationship between gender and income inequality. We know that uh, income earnings differ quite profoundly between males and females, as defined in most, uh, in most income, uh, so, so social income surveys. Um, why is that the case? Um, in order to understand or explain why that's the case, we need to refer to mechanisms. Um, how do social properties exert their influence on individuals? And with reference to gender, for example, we often talk about um, we we often talk about gender norms formed through different stages of socialization. So as a society, we tend to compartmentalize people on the basis not just of biological characteristics but also social characteristics. So we associate the biological genders of male female with particular social characteristics, like femininity, masculinity, and so on. And this has implications at all stages of the life course. Education researchers are especially interested in how this translates into different um, advantages, whether that's through you know, attention uh, or streaming onto particular subjects. And again, how that translates or how that carries forward later in the life course towards um, the subjects that people study and so on. And also how over the course of our lives we acquire, um, we acquire biases, whether conscious or unconscious, with respect to gender. And so all of these things together, these are mechanisms, these are ways in which we can explain how, you know, much later in an individual's life, say in their 20s, 30s and 40s and so on, um, why income or why earnings differ on the basis of gender. So that would be a mechanism when we try and explain, when, when we try and articulate um, how gender causes or is related to um, in, in inequality, 
what we're doing is we're specifying uh, or articulating a mechanism. This is really important for environmental sociology as well because we're going to spend a lot of time thinking about how social properties influence environment. We talked about this quite a lot already. So what were the effects of um, capitalism or the emergence of capitalism on the organization of global labor but also on environments? We looked at a pretty profound example of this in the case of uh, the Great Dying in 17th century South America. So during the waves of Spanish and Portuguese uh, colonization of the Americas and so on, we looked at we looked at the phenomenon of the Great Dying, and that sort of articulated um, a connection between the social on the one hand, i.e., colonialism, uh, and the ecological on the other hand, uh, this global this global cooling effect. And then finally, uh, sitting above all this, we have we have theories, and theories are very general statements about the essential features of some aspect of the social world. Now, most of you. Um, that have studied sociology so far or are studying it at degree level um, these sort of grand theories will have been the basis of a lot of what you've studied so in classical social theory you looked at the big ideas so Weber's, Weber's ideas about sort of the, the emergence of capitalism and bureaucracies and so on and the rootedness of um, the rootedness of capitalism in a particular uh, in, in, a, in a particular ethic of work which was sort of divided along religious lines but we also have grand theories that deal with things like the nature of systems, and this is one and this is one body of theory that we're going to look at today. So theories are very sort of general statements about about how the world works on a very sort of large scale. Sort of, we have theories about how individuals relate to each other, of course, and theories can range from you know the micro from very sort of small scale um, interactional aspects of social life, how we communicate, how we form shared understandings, and so on. And then theories can be at a very, very large scale. So they can be at the level of the world system, um, international or inter-country and so on. So theories operate at many, many different sort of levels and scales, but they're more general. But the point is, the point of Swedberg's uh, division of theory into these three domains is that all of these things have to work together. We can't understand how the world works and how things relate to each other unless we have uh, a good grasp of concepts, mechanisms, and then grand theories uh, to tie all these things together. So in the most basic terms, um, a system is simply any entity composed of multiple interrelated parts or constituent units. Um, and usually within this, um, the entities within the system are not static. Uh, they're moving, they relate to each other. Um, they can be circulating either matter, they can be circulating energy or information. And this is sort of the classical, what we we'll later refer to as um, the engineering definition of systems. And probably the easiest way to get a handle on the notion of system is to think in terms of engineering systems. These are things like engines. So an engine is an example of, um, is often a useful example of a system. It has inputs and outputs. It in, you know, takes in air, it takes in fuel and so on. It expels, them, uh, it expels waste and it, it, these different elements circulate within the engine and so on to produce an effect. But we also have things like ecosystems. So we talked a lot about the concept of ecosystem in week two. An ecosystem is often subjectively defined. It, it can be sort of geographically defined in terms of an ecosystem can be, um, you know, a prairie system or a mountain system or a system of mountain pasturage, as we looked at in uh, the examples of the Torbo Commons in week four. But we also have other systems. So a family can be a system, a community or a society. Um, there are different interacting actors within those systems. Um, they coexist together. They can be, to greater or lesser extents, interdependent on each other and so on. And... In systems theory, then, we tend to distinguish between several different types of system, but there are four principal, three principal differences we'll look at. So the first is the idea of a simple system. Um, a simple system is one where we can identify the key parts, where behavior is regular and predictable and unchanging in the short to medium term. And certainly in the classical systems theories that we we'll look at in a moment from the early, from the late 19th, early 20th century, these were organized very much on the assumption of or on the principles of simple systems. And we'll see as we work through this, really what, what we're going to do in the next set of slides is kind of deconstruct this notion of simple systems. Can we think of human societies um, as simple systems? And the argument that we're going to make within this lecture is that it's really not that easy. Human systems are not really simple. We often can't you know, identify uh, what the key parts are. We'll talk about this later on with reference to the boundary problem. Um, human behavior is often not regular and predictable and as we've seen in the last in, in the last couple of weeks um, our, our, our regular behaviors of course have been profoundly affected um, by something from without in the case of the COVID-19 pandemic uh, 
So uh, in terms of predictability, we can't really say that human behavior is um, is predictable, essentially, although there are many disciplines that stake their reputations on doing so. And again, we'll talk about that later on as well. So in terms of classical systems theory, then, the distinction is often made between closed systems, which do not import matter, energy, or information. These are the classical kind of engineering systems. Open systems are those that exchange matter, energy, or information with their environments and export waste. And we can apply this concept quite readily to human systems. So human systems, quite obviously, human societies are open systems, and they exchange matter. We take in foodstuffs and raw materials, we process them, convert them, and we expel their byproducts um, as waste, either as, for example, carbon emissions in the industrial process, um, as food waste, um, as different as different forms of pollutants um, in cars and so on. And we also exchange information. We exchange information um, with each other. So information has a very sort of has a realist interpretation in the one sense. Uh, we communicate with each other in order to survive, in order to conduct our daily lives. So we share information in a, in a human system. It's an open system in a sense. Um, but we also communicate with our, with our environments. We have to exist in dialogue with our environments. And again, basic principle of environmental sociology. If there is no exchange or importation of matter, of the raw materials into the human system, there's no society. We don't eat, we die. It's that simple. And, and the fourth point here then on holism is quite important. And this is the principle of irreducibility. And when we talk about systems, it's very important that we keep in mind this notion of irreducibility. Whenever we talk about a system, we're talking about a system is essentially a group, um, as we said in the first in the first line, composed of multiple interrelated parts or constituent units. But a system is greater than that. A system is not simply just an aggregation of different units. And we'll be talking about this later because it's a problem. It's kind of an insurmountable problem that really has never has never really been resolved in the in the in the systems theory debate. And this is the the idea of you probably you might you, you might you might have heard this before is. Um, of a system being greater than the sum of its parts. And one of the kind of philosophical sort of practical questions we'll be asking as we go through this is, is a system simply, you know, just a collection of different individuals or is a system something greater than that? In other words, when humans come together and interact, do they produce something that's greater than the sum of those parts, a collective? And the really sort of interesting question for us then is, you know, can we understand the properties of that system only with reference to the individuals. In other words, if we were to sort of break down society into its constituent parts, can we understand how systems behave simply by understanding the individuals? Um, and of course, sociology is premised on, you know, it's a very basic premise of sociology that we can't. Um, the idea of, or the opposite idea is simply that if we understand the individual, in other words, if we were to derive, you know, exactly what you know, motivates or drives human behavior on a very, very simple individual level, maybe even on a genetic level, we wouldn't need sociology because we would simply be able to predict and understand um, how people behave in groups by understanding how individuals behave. Um, but that's not the case. And that's what makes social systems um, so unpredictable. Again, we're going to talk quite a lot about this idea of um, complexity and particularly unpredictability. Uh, human systems often produce consequences um, or behavioral patterns that cannot simply be explained um, with reference to the way that the way that individuals work. So in other words, basic point from this is we need to understand the properties of the collective, we need to understand the properties of the group, we also need to understand the properties of the individual. And it's not necessarily the case that we can reduce one to the other, that we can understand the system from its parts or the parts from the properties um, of the system. And so in the classic sort of engineering definition of systems then, we can think of um, we talked about this in week two when we talked about this, uh, what, what, what we call the separatist ontology uh, of, of the social and the ecological. So on the one hand, on the left, we've got human systems in this block over here, individuals, groups, um, institutions. When we refer to institutions going through this, uh, an institution simply means something like, uh, you know, a family system, an education system, a welfare system, a system of government and so on. Um, institutions are stable features of societies. Um, and we'll talk. We'll maybe try and impose a better, uh, a better definition on that later. And on the right hand side, we've got ecological systems. So we have uh, resources. What 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 we tend to conceive of as resources, or what you'll see here, that's labelled um, in the bottom label as ecosystem goods, um, fuel, foodstuffs, 
uh, raw materials, whether that's you know water, air, and so on. And in the classic sort of engineering depiction of the relationship between both, um, we have this sort of circular model where humans act on ecosystems and they exploit them either through you know fishing, logging, intensive agriculture, and so on. And the ecological system then provides us with, or we extract from it, um, ecosystem goods which we use to fuel the human system. And then this goes in sort of a constant, constant uh, recursive cycle. In order to, in order to sustain and reproduce the human system, we need ecological inputs and so on. But this line of thinking, the engineering approach to this, views the human and the ecological very much as separate entities, but also the ecological as something that's there in service to humanity as a provider of as a provider of services or goods. Another way of looking at this then would be to take a more complex view of it. This is quite a complicated diagram, but if you look on the left, it's essentially the same as the previous, just on the one hand now on the left, we've got the ecological and on the right, we've got the social. On the right, we've got humanity and on the left, we've got, we've got nature and ecology. And what this diagram is trying to show us then is that actually the relationship between these two is considerably more complex than we think. Uh, not only can human societies act upon the environment, but environments can react upon humanity. And you're probably seeing if you're keeping up with some of the articles on, on the COVID epidemic, there are some articles appearing on um, the relationship between the appearance, um, the appearance of new viruses uh, as a result of intensive agriculture. Um, whether that's you know the centralization of masses of humans uh, in urban centers, uh, the importation of foodstuffs, but also the extent um, of agriculture, the fact that we are now um, exploiting either through construction or agriculture more previously uncultivated parts of the planet than we are in the past. So there's some sort of writings and musings going around about the reaction um, of nature on humanity. But we already see this in a big way with respect to the climate crisis. And we know we have pretty sound evidence to show us that there is quite a clear mechanism between um, intense, b between uh, humans and humanity's impact on the environment, sorry, through industrial emissions, rising CO2, uh, and an increase in things like uh, climate hazards. So if we were to look at um, the idea of sort of the reaction of nature on society, and again, it doesn't, it's not entirely helpful to maintain these kind of these separations. We could look at the wave of bushfires that happened over the Christmas period um, in Australia. So a collection of circumstances uh, that resulted in um, very extensive bushfires that burned for many, many months. And if we compare it to sort of the depiction that we see here in the classical engineering approach, it's different in the sense that while one approach, um, the classical systems approach tends to treat, you know, humans act on the environment, the environment provides goods and so on. The more complex kind of social ecological systems approach looks not just at human actions on the environment, but also how environments adjust and react and can impact upon, upon society. And we talked about some of this in week two, we talked about ecological determinism or the idea that sort of human behavior is simply is simply dictated by environmental cues. And it's not the case either that we want to say that, you know, human behavior is entirely dictated by environment or genetics and so on. Even though, of course, to some extent, those are very, those are very, very important to understanding human behavior. But what we want to get at is this idea that it's not simply a one way relationship that humanity, you know, exploits the environment, the environment provides goods and the two are, the two are separate. Human behavior um, is conditioned by its relationship with its environment. Um, as a society, we react and we adjust to different environmental cues. One of the most extreme and obvious examples of this being climate change. But um, in the past, of course, and we've looked at the examples, we, we looked at the example of famine uh, in the week just before the break. And we saw that, you know, particular features of the social systems of the time, particularly colonial social systems, had extremely profound impacts on the environment. And again, the reactions from um, environment, and if you like, um, were as a consequence of the circumstances, uh, the ecological circumstances were formed uh, through the social system. So the colonial exploitation um, of Indian raw materials, um, the marshalling of the Indian populace in uh, West Bengal into the um, into the war economy, and also in an, uh, in the case of Ireland, how um, how the rental system and landlordism uh, fed into a particular fit into the emergence of a particular type of agriculture, monoculture, and that proved disastrous when blight finally arrived um, in 1845. And so the question that we're thinking of now is having seen these sort of preliminary definitions of what a system is, what system means, can we think of societies as systems? And if so, what kinds of system are they? Uh, we've seen many examples of this over the course of the 20th century. 
Some of these more famous than others. Um, Kenneth Boulding in 1966 forwarded this, this idea of what he called what he called spaceship Earth, and this was around the time where um, there was sort of a spring. In, uh, there was an emergence around this time of sort of writings um, and very in, in, in influential works uh, like Rachel Carson's *The Silent Springs*. Um, around this time, also the Club of Rome. Later, sorry, um, later in the seventies, the Club of Rome would publish uh, *The Limits*, *The Limits to Growth*. And so around this time, we start to see the emergence of what would later sort of, uh, evolve into the modern ecological or environmental, and particularly at the time, the conservationist movement. So Kenneth Bowling's idea of spaceship Earth emphasised this notion of this notion of stewardship, the idea that we needed not just to be that we needed to think not just in terms of the welfare of our you know families, communities, or countries, but to think of human welfare on a planetary level. That we need to be good stewards of the planet, and that the sort of the spaceship analogy was um, was the idea that you know we're all we're all in this together. We need to act together on a planetary level rather than a national level. Um, and he also talked about things like shifting uh, from quality, sh sorry, shifting to quality rather than rate. So we need to focus on at the minute, um, and again, this is still very much the case today. We focus very much on the rate and volume of production rather than rather than quality. Um, our production systems are geared towards mass production and the driving down of costs. And Boulding made an argument that well, instead of mass consumption, we needed to think perhaps about you know slowing down production and thinking more about the quality of the things we do and the sustainability of the things we make. And we'll be coming back to this in a couple of weeks when we look at uh, modern political economy theories of um, degrowth or negative growth, the idea that we shouldn't be organising our economies and our social policies on the expectation of continuous growth. Uh, later in the 1970s then, we had James Greer Miller's Living Systems Theory, which we'll look at in the next slide. And Miller proposed that we consider um, humanity and ecology uh, and nature as sort of... A, as a nested hierarchy of subsystems, which would capture all organizational levels of social and biotic life. And what Miller meant by this was this idea that we could come up with an exhaustive model um, of all the different levels of organization from the cell all the way up to the group to the society. There were originally, if I remember this, I think 13 in the original and 19 in the revised different organizational levels. And so these are just four, sorry, these four are just taken out for example. So Miller says, if we were to think of, you know, the basic sort of elementary building blocks of building blocks of society, um, we have to think of it on the cellular level. So the first sort of system level is the cell. Um, what are cells? You know, where are their boundaries? How do we define what a cell is? A cell is defined by its outer membrane. And then he used these different um, these different headings. So reproducer, boundary, distributor, motor to say that in all of these different organization levels, we can identify boundaries in different ways, we can identify distributors in different ways, how do the different elements within the system circulate, which is what he meant by, by distributor, uh, and by motor, what is the driver of this? So if we look at this, if we look at the boundary column, um, going down from cell to organism to group to society, um, how do we identify or how do we monitor the boundaries uh, of a cell? The boundary of a cell is defined by its outer membrane, the boundary of an organism by its skin or outer covering, uh, the boundary of a family by the rules defined by the family um, and a society is defined by its borders uh, which are policed by and monitored by you know, customs and security and you know it seems quite bizarre to articulate things in this way um, we don't obviously sort of hold to this line of thinking today um, anymore but nonetheless it reflects what was common in the 60s and 70s which was this sort of general theory movement amongst physical and social scientists and, and, and attempt to derive sort of an exhaustive theoretical model which would capture all elements of social and biological life. And that was Miller's living systems theory. One more influential example from the late 1970s was James Lovelock's Gaia hypothesis. And this was sort of an analogy which tried to depict the earth as a living organism with an inbuilt feedback system. Uh, and the idea here was that um, was that you know the more that we we as humans continue to impact and pollute our environments, the more that Earth is going to react upon us. Um, so he sort of conceptualized the planet uh, as as an organism with 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 a feedback system, and argued that if we as humanity continue on the path that we are in, um, there will be you know the Earth will at the Earth as 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 an organism will you know activate this feedback system and so on. And so why this was so influential was. It essentially it decentered humans 
so before this we were sort of accustomed to thinking of you know the driving goal of uh, planetary consciousness was for the sake of humanity but guy um lovelock sorry pointed out instead that you know the presence of humanity is really irrelevant on a planetary scale because the earth is going to be here you know long after we're gone and so he positioned humans sort of very far down the hierarchy of priority by saying that well you know the earth is an organism you know, humans are resident on that organism but the earth will be here you know long after us and if we don't take good care of it then um it has the feedback systems to deal with um, to deal with irritants talking about humanity so sort of he pushed humanity down um, and made the earth uh, as a planetary organism central and of course today we still see the persistence of the notion of system uh, more recently through uh, the climate strikes and Greta, Thun Gre Greta Thunberg's adoption of um, a slogan that was popularized by uh, Ian Angus in his 2019 book system change not climate change so this is something we'll return to later when we get to looking at models of models of climate governance and so today as well, we're we are encouraged by various social movements to think on a planetary scale, but to think in terms of systems. Um, in other words, and the, the logic behind the system change, not climate change thing is that, well, we can't deal with climate change within the current system that we operate within. We can't you know, deal with it through emissions caps and you know, carbon taxes and so on. We need to change, fundamentally change our social system. And quite often this means um, in the in the thinkings of people like Anne Pettifor, like Angus and so on, um, either nudging the economy towards some form of sort of hybrid capitalist green eco-socialism um, or full eco-socialism or whatever that might be. And so essentially what we need to understand here is that scientific thinking does not remain stable. This was best articulated by Thomas Kuhn. Um, in his famous book, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions. And so just as our thinking about environment and society has evolved, as we saw in the waves of classical theory that we looked at in the first half of the course, um, so too has our understanding of system evolved. And Kuhn in his work talks a lot about this idea of the succession of paradigms of knowledge. So um, in this book, he's looking at what he called the structure of scientific knowledge at different, at different historical epochs. And so uh, historically, we can see some of the more profound of these in the Copernican move towards heliocentrism. So the idea that one of the most profoundly epoch defining changes, if you like, in scientific thinking um, of the last millennium was um, our, our shift from the idea of the Earth as the center of the universe um, to the sun as the center of a solar system, the Earth as a constituent planet within that and so on. And sort of um, a view of the cosmos that took in the wider universe rather than seeing the earth as the center of everything. And then later on, we had other successive revolutions, the arrival of Newtonian mechanics with the publications of the Principia and so on, uh, revolutionized our understanding of you know, very, very basic elementary features of our physical environments, you know, motion and so on and gravity. Um, and then later on, we've had things like, you know, sociology was defined in the early 20th century, at least by structural functionalism which again is very much a, a variant of classical systems theory. And we've since moved away from that. So scientific knowledge is never stable. It evolves and our knowledge is evolving all the time. Um, and of course, we fully expect that you know, as we continue to address and overcome the COVID-19 crisis, that our thinking will evolve, um, will evolve as well. We will need new ideas. We will need new paradigms um, to think about um, a life with, you know, a, a life with pandemics. And so what I want to do is just to talk you through or to identify some of the classical individuals within this. Um, and to date, really, we're talking about sort of the mid, you know, really the early to the mid 20th century. One of the most famous of these being an individual called Ludwig von Bertelandt, a biologist by trade, um, who in the 1950s was one of the instigators of a movement that became known as the classical systems theory movement. And some of the contributors to this included people like Kenneth Boulding and also James Greer Miller. And this was, at this time, what we see in the writings of these individuals is an attempt to go beyond their individual disciplines and to think about, you know, the relationships between the social and the ecological, the natural, the biological, and so on. In the 1950s and 60s, there was quite a remarkable degree of dialogue and sort of thinking and theorizing between disciplines, between biologists, engineers, ecologists, social scientists, economists, and so on, um, that persisted for quite a long time before it eventually fragmented later on in the 80s, in the 80s and 90s. And 
some of the key ideas then of these classical uh, systems theories were that the idea that there's sort of a similarity of process and structure. They were very taken with this idea that we could have you know, a common vocabulary that everyone could use. So the idea here was that regardless of whether you were a biologist, an ecologist, an economist, a sociologist, everyone could speak from the same conceptual template. We all had the same basic ideas or basic understanding about what systems were, how societies, organisms, and so on were constituted, so that we all understood or could communicate easily with, with one another. So there was an assumption that there, the processes and structures were similar between social entities um, and natural, biological or ecological entities. And these were defined by some very, very simple features. All living systems must secure matter, energy, food, fuel, in order to maintain structure and to process waste. So that's an essential, a basic feature of human societies as well. To reproduce ourselves, we require inputs. And to reproduce ourselves on a societal level, um, we need the constant circulation of uh, materials, uh, inputs, we need the processing of waste and so on, the goal being to maintain to maintain structure and to maintain our social structure, maintain our social order. And some other common features then of this of this movement were the idea of metabolism. And these authors suggested that metabolism was central to all systems. Uh, and this is a, a concept that derives from biochemistry. And according to Miller and um, Miller and particularly von Bertelhoff, the idea of metabolism could be applied not only at sort of the cellular and, cellular and the organic level, but also to, uh, to the social level. So instead of thinking of, you know, society circulate, you know, matter and nutrients and so on, uh, in one particular way, cells do it and another, biological entities do it and another, the idea was simply that we talk about these as a common metabolism. There is a social metabolism and there is a biological metabolism, but fundamentally or essentially they're the same. And they were also quite taken with this notion of stability. And if we were to ask the question of classical systems theorists in the 50s, that what is the goal of or what is the, the overarching aim of all these processes, they would say the aim is stability. Social systems strive for stability just as ecological and biological entities strive for stability as well, um, to expel irritants, um, to maintain their structure, to maintain their function. In other words, to persist in a healthy state um, and to maintain themselves um, as they are, essentially, to reproduce as they are. What this implied then was that any of these failures uh, within any of these systems were simply malfunctions. The notion that systems always strive to remain within what they call steady state parameters. So there was a profound assumption here that the goal of all societies, biological entities, was to remain the same, was to remain unchanging. And this would become very problematic in the 70s and 80s for sociologists who were starting to emphasize or focus more on things like social inequalities. If we were to ask the question then, well, if the essential, if the driving goal of you know, societies is to maintain themselves as they are, um, maybe that's not a desirable goal if you know, our social structure is fundamentally, is fundamentally unequal. And so we've seen some of these in classical um, in the classical theories, people like Herbert Spencer, who coined the term survival of the fittest, was quite taken with this notion of the analogy between society uh, society as an organism and profoundly influenced, uh, influenced by science at the time. These ideas would later be incorporated by people like um, Emile Durkheim, who was very, very taken with the ideas of with the idea of the reproduction of social stability and social order. Um, how does social solidarity emerge? Uh, what function does it play? What role is played by um, what what role is played by institutions and structures, in other words, in the reproduction of society. Uh, later individuals like Lawrence Henderson would take this a little bit further and start making direct comparisons between uh, mechanisms, of so mechanisms of social control. And he would suggest that actually, well, if we look at if we look at social control, it's actually analogous to what we what we already see in biological entities. So they're no they're no different. And then later into the 20th century, we have some of the sort of giants of modern social theory like Talcott Parsons, um, who would focus very much on structure and function as the defining features of sociology. And in the early 20th century, at least for Parsons and for many of his, and again, this was a very, very influential body of theory. You'll learn more about this next year in your contemporary social theory course. But basically, Parsons was quite concerned with, first of all, understanding what the basic constituent elements of human society were. And in his view, these were things like the family, the education system, um, hierarchies, which included things like government, but also included um, other things like, for example, the legal system, the policing system, and so on. And also systems of culture, systems of culture also embody 
and body hierarchies. And the, the two components of this then were once we had identified the structure, we had to identify the function. In other words, what are the processes by which society reproduces? How is structure reproduced and how is equilibrium maintained? Um, and for Parsons, these were things like what he called value consensus. So humans internalize particular values, uh, we're socialized to be acquiescent to authority, we're socialized into a particular social order, into particular types of labor market, into particular types of welfare states and so on. Uh, our expectations are conditioned by these. And for Parsons, this, this value consensus uh, was an essential part of the functional, the functional aspect of society. So how do societies persist and reproduce? They do so through things like value consensus. Individuals become socialized and they adopt the dominant ideas and that's how societies reproduce. So again, this emphasis on structure and function. What is the structure? How is it maintained? And what are the functions that maintain that structure? He also talked quite a lot about things like negative feedback. Um, so quite simply, you know, negative feedback is if we break the law and we're detected, we're punished. And uh, that's a negative feedback mechanism. But there are others as well. There are, some of them are less, you know, some of them aren't even you know, codified by the state. Um, we can be, things can be disapproved of by our peers. Um, certain behaviours are considered unacceptable and so on. So there are all kinds of negative feedback that we encounter in our daily lives and uh, that for Parsons are an essential feature um, of, of, the, of the social order. So with the systems theories of the mid 20th century, we're left with a problem. First of all, there's the assumption that these systems tend toward what's referred to as stability and homeostasis. And this was a position that was held to by many systems theorists for quite a long time, really until the end of the 1960s, 1970s. And you'll f learn more about this next term or next year, sorry, in third year in your contemporary theory course. Um, in the 60s and 70s, sociologists start to move sort of away from this grand theorizing of the classical systems theories of people like Parsons and Buckley and so on and start looking more at sort of interactional theories on the micro level of human behavior. Um, principally things like symbolic interactionism, um, ethnomethodology and phenomenology and so on. But if we were to, assuming that we're trying to use this body of theory to understand the behavior of systems today, um, it leaves us with a problem. And the problem is this assumption that systems, um, that, the, over, the, that the, the overriding urge, if you like, or reason for existence of systems is to maintain um, stability and equilibrium. And this is often referred to as the homeostasis problem. So it's around this time that systems theorists start to look beyond this towards views that emphasize systems as being in a state, a constant state of change. Now, we know already that social systems are quite different to conventional or sort of classical engineering systems. And we often refer to social systems as what's called complex, open, adaptive systems, or sometimes open systems, adaptive systems, and so on. The terminology differs, but generally, there's agreement that social systems are different from this classic model and that really the classical systems theories don't quite capture this this dynamism um, adequately enough. So according to Parsons' formulation of systems theory, um, equilibrium is a state where individuals are integrated through value consensus. So there's a socialization process in a social system. Uh, the members of that system, i.e. that society, um, acquire particular values, they're socialized into particular systems of normative behavior. And this is how system equilibrium is maintained. So to put it quite crudely, you know, we're socialized into a capitalist economy. Um, the norm of a capitalist economy is to receive an education, training, go to work, um, spend that money to sustain an economy and so on, to reproduce, to form families and whatever. So at a very general level, sort of the classical, these were the classical assumptions of um, what the social order was. But there's a problem with this because, first of all, it implies that the existing social order is desirable. We've said already that, you know, quite often there can be an equilibrium. So we can be in an equilibrium position. Um, and if we were to just look at the present day, we could say that, yes, there is a remarkable degree of persistence in social systems. Um, our societies keep, not so much likely, but our societies keep, you know, persisting more or less the same as they've been in the medium, in the medium term. Um, but can we say that that state is desirable when we're in a position where we're causing, you know, unprecedented ecological damage, where there's high inequality, where there's international inequality, so huge inequalities in terms of national development. And we have considerable, considerably underdeveloped countries, to use the terminology. Um, we have countries where life expectancy is down in the 50s relative to those where it's in the 80s. 
It also assumes that the assumption of sort of homeostasis and stability assumes that we've kind of reached the end point of human social development and there's nowhere else to go. Um, this perspective would later become associated with a political theorist called Francis Fukuyama, who wrote quite a famous book called The End of History. Um, although this wasn't quite what he meant in his use of the end of history, um, there is an implication in classical systems theory that, you know, we've sort of reached high modernism. There's nowhere else to go. We've reached the optimal level of social order and that sort of societies are just going to persist in this um, in this current state with, you know, the current sets of social relations and so on um, indefinitely. So there's an assumption that a modern industrial capitalist society is sort of the end point of human development. And then the final implication of this then is the presumption that social change is actually undesirable because if we view sort of drives towards social change within this within this kind of consensus or stability model then uh, movements towards if you like enacting far-reaching social changes are seen as undesirable they're seen as destabilizing so in other words things like social revolutions social movements and that um, in the classical systems model could be viewed as destabilizers so even though you know normatively the object of social movements, for, for example, social justice movements, ecological justice movements, and so on, um, is, you know, normatively desirable from the point of view of a systems theorist. Um, it's not because it's a source of disturbance. So all of these assumptions um, present problems. How this is addressed then is through what's known as the complexity turn. And it's in the 80s and 90s that we start to see the emergence of an alternative approach to systems, which we refer to as complexity theory. And this is an approach that emphasizes um, the sort of the qualitatively different nature um, of human systems. We've, we've already suggested that we should be thinking of human systems not as kind of, you know, simple systems that simply process matter, energy, intent toward equilibrium, but as complex systems. Human societies adapt to their environments and circumstances. They're in a constant state of change and they're complex. They're difficult. Their behavior is difficult to predict. They're subject to change. So if we were to summarize this position or this problem um, in three points, we could say that, first of all, the assumption of classical systems theory was that you know, systems essentially behaved in the same way. And they dampened dissent, um, they encouraged socialization into normative consensus, and then they tended towards equilibrium. They just persisted as they were. Um, if we take this, if we take the logic of this forward, then we could also say that, well, if we simply understood the elementary or the basic kind of rules of human behavior adequately enough, then not only could we understand how societies behave, but we could also predict how they would behave in the future. Um, but we can't do that. And I'll show you an example of this in a moment. Even if we try to predict something with a, in a, within a relatively short time frame, for example, you know, the rate of economic growth, six or seven you know, months from now, um, it's remarkably difficult. And while it is, you know, within you know, certain kind of optimal conditions, we can do that uh, with some degree of accuracy. Um, overall, you know, the idea that we can predict the future of human behavior um, doesn't hold. And then finally, based on this, we can say that, well, we need to move away from this idea, um, this classical systems idea of, you know, adaptation and equilibrium. And instead, we should be thinking of social systems. And I'll introduce the concept of social ecological systems in a moment. Um, we should be thinking of them as complex adaptive systems. So what does this mean? So a complex system, and I encourage you, if you're looking at this um, online, I'll place a link in the description below this video. Um, there is a video that's linked on the following slide, and I do encourage you to look at that because it provides a pretty good overview of what we actually mean when we talk about a complex system. Um, a complex system is composed of several essential parts or features. Um, first of all, it's a system, and a system is a set of multiple elements and relations. A social system, um, you know, to be characterized as a system, needs a relatively large number of individuals, and those individuals interact. They exist in whatever it is, a city or a country or a society or whatever. They have uh, emergent properties. We've suggested that uh, when people get together and interact, they produce certain properties or phenomena that are not necessarily reducible to the individuals. We can't understand them fully by looking just at the individuals. So we use the example of gender norms. If we think of the example of how on a societal level, um, societies acquire sort of very pervasive and extensive norms um, around gender, 
We could also think of other properties like political preferences. Um, with the US elections going on this year, um, it's a good time to reflect on this because even though American politics is sort of presented as a binary between sort of the soft left of the Democrats and, um, and the GOP, the Republican Party, um, we can refer to these preference sets as emergent properties. Um, in other words, how did how did American society end up at this point of political polarization between these between these two parties? In other words, if we were to understand that, we wouldn't necessarily be able to understand how that came about, you know, by looking at or by simply, you know, interviewing a random set of individuals and asking them about it. We would have to study uh, the properties of that society at a higher level. We would have to look at its economy, its society, its history, and so on. Um, and other examples of emergent properties include things like um, additional forms of discrimination. Um, and these vary across societies and across countries. Um, one thing that we'll look at in a couple of weeks' time is the European Social Survey, which for years has been measuring, uh, has been measuring different forms of uh, different forms of discrimination, both experiences of and uh, attitudes toward. And discrimination is an emergent property because if we were to understand, you know, if we were to pick one individual, you know, from society at random. Um, and just question them about, you know, let's say we did discover that that individual held discriminatory ideas. To understand the origins of those ideas, you know, we couldn't just stop at the individual. We would need to understand the context in which that individual was socialized and raised. We would need to understand the social system they grew up in. So this is what we mean when we talk about emergence. Systems are also organized and they're often organized hierarchically. Um, we live within and we operate within uh, hierarchies of all kinds. Um, the families that we live in are nested within communities. So we conduct our daily lives within different kinds of systems. The university, the education system is just one example. But, you know, you live your lives within a community, um, within a friendship and kinship groups. These are you know, other kinds of system. Uh, you live within a country and that country sets you know, rules of conduct. It redistributes your income in different ways. And then our countries exist within global blocks, whether that's you know the global south, the developed north, whatever you want to call it. Now, complex systems are also nonlinear, and this is one of the central issues in complexity theory. And what really sets it apart from classical systems theory is this focus on nonlinearity. Um, at the moment, we're living through a profound period of nonlinearity. If we think about sort of the state of the state in which our social system was, say, six months ago, compared to where it is today, uh, we're at a point, you know, today that we couldn't possibly have predicted, you know, with any precision, six or seven six or seven months ago now that doesn't mean that people haven't been talking for years about the possibility of a pandemic of course they have um you know in some quarters we've known about this uh, the possibility of this for quite some time but the precise timing of this obviously is quite difficult quite difficult to pin down so we knew the conditions were there we just didn't know or we couldn't have expected with any degree of certainty that it would emerge in december and then transition to europe and the americas and so on so examples of nonlinearity are things like, um, well, the basic definition is nonlinearity is simply um, change over time that can emerge from apparently simple causes. And sometimes those causes can result in transitions. Um, more recently, there was the uh, much discussion around the centenary of the, the Russian Revolution, um, the, the Irish Revolution as well, the, um, sorry, the War of Independence and so on. And these were, you know, events of upheaval and they were nonlinear in the sense that they were radical departures from the norm. Um, you know, the anti-colonial struggles um, in Ireland were similar to those uh, in other colonial contexts as well. We looked at the case of India last week. And, you know, these these movements can emerge from, you know, often, you know, quite diverse origins. You know, social movements can draw their base from, you know, the working classes in different areas, um, from agricultural areas, from industrial workers. Um, they can be driven or facilitated by, you know, dissenting elites from above and so on. We'll look at a lot of this in week eight when we get to look at social movements. Um, a pandemic is an example of um, a property that can induce nonlinearity. Um, why is that the case? Because we, we are now, our society is now um, on a path that is a radical departure from the norm. Um, it's in a nonlinear state. So compared to how our economy was functioning six months ago, it's functioning quite differently um, today, now the state is making quite significant movements to prop up consumer demand by issuing wage guarantees and so on. So that's a radical departure from the type of public welfare system we had we had six months ago. And of course, climate hazards are a classical uh, example of this. 
Uh, we'll be looking at more of these later on. But of course, there are nonlinearities in the sense that climate hazards, although we know the conditions are there for them to predict them with accuracy is difficult, but we know that we know that they are now an, an inherent part of the system um, and that when they occur, um, they introduce or they induce changes um, in other aspects of society. Um, governments mobilize resources, citizens are displaced by climate hazards and so on. Um, the fifth feature then of complex systems is that they are connected, but they're connected in different ways. So we are quite obviously connected to, I am, I am connected to you at the moment through a system of a system of labour, the education system um, that we you know, live under and study under in Ireland is different to other types of education system. But we are connected in the sense that, you know, obviously I, you know, I do this job because I love it and I'm compensated well for it. But I work within a labour system and I'm connected to you as a teacher and you as a student. There are other types of connections like supply chains. Um, we're seeing a lot of talk at the moment about the importance of the, the food supply chain. How do we get essential supplies and so on during a pandemic? So there are supply chains provide connections between producers and consumers. And we're also connected virtually and physically. Um, we're not connected physically as much as we would have been before, but now we're also connected virtually. So when we talk about the exchange of you know matter and information within a system, um, these can be connected in different ways. We can be talking about real physical connections, you know, the movement of goods and so on, or we can be talking about the movement of information. And finally, number six, the really key feature of a complex system is that it's adaptive. Um, human systems are particularly adaptive. We respond to environmental feedback and we adapt our behavior accordingly. Sometimes that adaptation can be slow. And the example of climate change is a classic example of slow adaptation. Um, we'll be looking at the, um, the Paris agreements um, in a couple of sessions as an example of sort of a slow adaptation mechanism. And there are various means through which uh, internationally, governments have tried to cooperate on climate change mitigation measures. Those have been slow adaptations, but now we're living through a period of fast adaptation. States have had to respond very, very quickly, passing emergency measures, um, introducing lockdowns and restrictions on movements and so on. So our systems are adaptive to feedback, but they adapt in different ways, and that can be fast adaptation or slow adaptation. Now, the next slide I've given you a link to um, a video, and I'll put the link down below. I'm not going to play this video in its entirety um, within this session right here, but I do encourage you to look at it. It's a good illustration and demonstration um, visually as well of what I've just of what I've just talked about. So we often refer to um, you'll see this process of um, adaptation referred to um, also as what's called autopoiesis or self organization. So systems organize themselves despite the complexity within social systems. There is a remarkable degree of organization. Um, we live most of our lives um, in times of relative peace. Um, there are you know, rules of conduct, there are policing systems, legal systems and so on. Uh, and there's a remarkable degree of self-organization. In general, people adapt to and conform to the norms of a particular society. Um, these can be you know, destabilized in different ways um, through you know, political upheavals and so on, through wars and conflicts, uh, just to give you an extreme example. But in general, um, our systems, our societies are relatively are relatively organized. Um, life goes on and life persists because of what we call this autopilotic property. Systems organize, and when our societies are confronted with um, are confronted with threats from outside, in the example of the COVID pandemic, let's say, um, we have this adaptive capacity. We can react and we can and we can respond. Now, the key feature, as I've said, of a complex system is that it's often unpredictable. Systems can end up in different pathways on different development paths that can change in different ways. And we refer to this as the property of nonlinearity. Um, there are several examples and some classic examples that complexity theorists or complex systems theorists have looked at um, are things like the, um, like the Industrial Revolution. Why did that take off particularly uh, in you know, Western Europe and the Americas? What were the features of those societies that made it conducive to the emergence of industry? And of course, to understand why Britain industrialized, as I mentioned in weeks four, we need to understand all the different circumstances surrounding it. The fact that it was, you know, it was it, it, it existed within a sort of this network of dependency, um, colonial dependency, sorry, where colonies supplied raw materials that allowed people to move from agriculture to urban centers and provide an industrial labor force and so on, cheap industrial labor. But there are also other things. Um, when we talk about path dependency, we talk about sort of pathways of change that can become set and locked in for 
you know, reasons that we're not entirely sure of. So things like the QWERTY keyboard, the QWERTY keyboard. Um, why is the layout of your keyboard like that? You know, those popular myths going around on the internet that, you know, it was set by, you know, by mechanical typists and typesetters um, who didn't want, you know, they deliberately disorganized or reorganized the keyboards to stop people wearing out keys to make them type slower and so on. Um, things like VHS tapes. Um, the 1980s is an example that was given by a famous economist called Brian Arthur um, of the emergence of videotapes, VHS. In the early 1980s, there, there, were, there were two competing video formats, um, the Sony Betamax uh, and the VHS. Um, later on, there would be different audio formats, so there were things like the CD, the mini disc. Um, we also have like, three competing formats, or had at one point three competing formats for movie distribution. There was HD, DVD, Blu-ray, and then conventional DVD. And you know, we're, all, we're we're complexity theorists are often concerned with this question of well, why do one or other of these technologies take root and become become you know the norm? Uh, and it's not always for obvious reasons. It's not always that sort of the best or the most optimal uh, technology you know, takes root, it's because people adapt to certain things in different ways and they start down certain paths and so on and these behaviours become become reinforced. So in the example of the VHS, um, it's simply distribution, the Betamax format might have been superior but VHS was more widely distributed and therefore um, people became locked into this pattern that, you know, technologically might have been suboptimal but um, nonetheless nonetheless took hold and became and, and became the norm. The second video I've included now is an introduction to uh, chaos theory. When we talk about this notion of path dependence um, and complexity, there's an illustration of um, the workings of chaos theory in this video. And again, I'll include the link uh, in the description below if you want to watch this. Sorry, this video and the one before it are both um, are both ten minutes, so they're relatively they're relatively quick to watch. So, if you've had a look at the previous video, what that video has shown you is that you know because of the nature of complex systems because systems can move you know quite quickly from one state to the other they can move unpredictably from one state to the other what does that mean about our capacity to anticipate um, to anticipate change or to predict change in complex systems a good example of this is a paper from um, Dovern and Weiser from 2011 and what they're doing in this paper is they they essentially conduct an audit of previous forecast studies what they've done in this graph, and again, don't worry about the graph so much, it's just there for, uh, if you if you want to look through it and pick through it in your own time, you can. Uh, what do we mean by this notion of unpredictability? So what they've done here is you'll see that this is organized into four rectangles, starting with um, the United States, um, Italy, uh, the United States again, and Germany. So the US is there, but these are for two different sources. You'll see one is the INFL and the other one is the CONS. And what they've done is they've taken together or compiled um, different predictions of the economic growth rate over this period. So the line that you're looking at, um, let's see if I can move my mouse over here. The line that you're looking at here is the actual recorded economic growth rate. And these boxes, these are box plots. And what this line is showing you is the median prediction from this group of studies at this particular point in time. So at all of these different points, what this is showing you is the position of uh, the prediction, the predicted economic growth rate relative to the actual economic growth rate. And this goes back to this principle of, well, if you know societies um, and economies were simple systems and behaved as simple systems, um, we could simply predict the state, their future states, you know, quite easily. Um, if we look at sort of the accuracy of historical economic forecasts, we see that even with something you know, as relatively bounded as the economy, you know, we think we understand the conditions of the economy, you know, we have labor and capital inputs and labor markets and production processes and so on. So you would think we could, with a reasonable degree of accuracy, predict um, economic growth rates. In some contexts, we can, uh, under certain conditions, we can. But there's many instances where the observed economic growth rate is actually quite far below the predicted. So in other words, what this paper is revealing is that not only are there wildly different estimates of the growth rate between different studies, different points in time and different methodologies. Overall, it also differs quite sharply from the observed. So, and this is due to the complex nature of the system that people are trying to predict. So sociologists will say that, well, if we were trying to predict a social property, let's say, you know, the state of gender or income inequality, you know, a year, two years from now, um, perhaps we could make an educated guess or a forecast, but an accurate prediction would be relatively impossible. 
And so we're left with this sort of paradox. Um, on the one hand, we have this body of theory complexity telling us that, well, you know, systems are not, do not behave, social systems do not behave in this classical sense, you know, as, you know, stable entities, they're constantly changing, they're in a constant state of flux. Um, how do we reconcile this sort of, the fact that, you know, we live our lives in societies and those societies are relatively, you know, stable, at least on our time horizon and within our worldview, you know, predictable. But at the same time, they're complex. They change in different ways. They change in often unpredictable ways. So how do we how do we reconcile this? So the way that we describe systems um, and particularly changes within social systems uh, and also ecological systems is often described as nonlinear. What do we actually mean by that? The best way to describe that is through an example. And the example that I'm going to show you is um, this example, which is narrated by George Mumbio of The Guardian. And you might have seen this already. It's a very short video. Um, titled How Wolves Change Rivers. So this is going to give you an example of this um, this idea that, you know, from very simple starting points and from very simple initial conditions, um, quite complex changes can result from, you know, minor or minute changes um, in the initial behaviours of a system. So we'll have a look at this and then we'll look at some of the general principles, some of the general principles of it afterwards and discuss them. Exciting scientific findings of the past half century has been the discovery of widespread trophic cascades. A trophic cascade is an ecological process which starts at the top of the food chain and tumbles all the way down to the bottom. And the classic example is what happened in the Yellowstone National Park in the United States when wolves were reintroduced in 1995. Now, we, we all know that wolves kill various species of animals, but perhaps we're slightly less aware that they give life to many others. Before the wolves turned up, they'd been absent for 70 years, but the numbers of deer, because there was nothing to hunt them, had built up and built up in the Yellowstone Park, and despite efforts by humans to control them, they'd managed to reduce much of the vegetation there to almost nothing. They'd just grazed it away. But as soon as the wolves arrived, even though they were few in number, they started to have the most remarkable effects. First, of course, they killed some of the deer, but that wasn't the major thing. Much more significantly, they radically changed the behavior of the deer. The deer started avoiding certain parts of the park, the places where they could be trapped most easily, particularly the valleys and the gorges. And immediately, those places started to regenerate. In some areas, the height of the trees quintupled in just six years. Bare valley sides quickly became forests of aspen and willow and cottonwood. And as soon as that happened, the birds started moving in. The number of songbirds and migratory birds started to increase greatly. The number of beavers started to increase because beavers like to, to eat the trees. And beavers, like wolves, are ecosystem engineers. They create niches for other species. And the dams they built in the rivers um, provided habitats for otters and muskrats and ducks and fish and reptiles and amphibians. The wolves killed coyotes and as a result of that, the number of rabbits and mice began to rise, which meant more hawks, more weasels, more foxes, more badgers. Ravens and bald eagles came down to feed on the carrion that the wolves had left. Bears fed on it too, and their population began to rise as well, partly also because there were more berries growing on the regenerating shrubs. And the bears reinforced the impact of the wolves by killing some of the calves of the deer. Here's where it gets really interesting. The wolves changed the behavior of the rivers. They began to meander less. There was less erosion. The channels narrowed. More pools formed. More riffle sections, all of which were great for wildlife habitats. The rivers changed in response to the wolves. And the reason was that the regenerating forests 
stabilize the banks so that they collapsed less often, so that the rivers became more fixed in their course. Similarly, by driving the deer out of some places and the vegetation recovering on the valley sides, there was a soil erosion because the vegetation stabilized that as well. So the wolves, small in number, transformed not just the ecosystem of the Yellowstone National Park, this huge area of land, but also its physical geography. So that video is a good demonstration of the principle of sensitivity to initial conditions that you will have seen if you uh, looked at the previous video about the uh, on the demonstration of complexity theory. Um, it's not to say so again, remembering from that video that there's a problem in the, sort of the public understanding of complexity or chaos, which is this idea of sort of complex causal chains so that, you know, one event kickstarts another event that leads to that leads to something else. Um, the idea behind the analogy of the Lawrence attractor, um, this is Edward Lawrence, sorry, the MIT meteorologist simulation, was that um, as Lawrence was running his weather simulation, um, when he re-entered um, the conditions of his simulation um, to only, I think it was the seventh or eighth decimal place rather than the 16th, he ended up with, over several iterations, a radically different prediction of the weather system, the weather system, sorry. Um, as the simulation continued to run. So what that means is using the example of the previous video is if you could consider what would have happened um, to that park system with or without the introduction of the wolves. So what the introduction of the wolves did was produce this complex causally related chain of events that led to the system um, ending up in a much different um, in, a, in a much different state than it would have been if they hadn't been introduced. So this is a classic example of what we refer to as nonlinearity and sensitivity to initial conditions. And where are we going with this? It's crucially important that we keep this aspect of complexity in mind when we think about how to strategize for change. Um, it's especially important when we think about climate, because again, the overriding, our emphasis here in this course is on the complex nature of social ecological systems. Humans are coupled with, dependent on um, our ecosystems, our environments. Um, and that coupling bring with it necessarily uh, a complexity. It's very difficult to predict how systems behave and change. And the human element adds even more complexity to that. So some of the differences between, on the left hand side, we've got um, examples of principles for a simple system uh, in this table, sorry. And on the right hand side, we've got the contrasting behavior of a complex system. So this is um, a paper that's, uh, the citation of which is given above that you can download from the library if you want. Um, organizing principles for advancing research methods and approaches. So we won't talk through all of these, but just to take the example of say the second one down here. So in a simple system, we could say for each input to the system, there is a proportionate output. You know, this all kind of Newtonian idea that every action is an equal and opposite reaction. So for an input to the system to be, to produce a proportionate output implies that, you know, if we change something or we add something, there's a predictable, but also proportionate output. In the Yellowstone example, that's patently not the case. So in a complex adaptive system, we say that outputs are not proportionally related to inputs and that minor changes can cause abrupt reorganization. So the example here is that if we trace from the point of the introduction of the walls to the end point where we see, you know, visible effects on the river course, the water course, and also on, um, you know, the pace and rate of soil erosion, we can say that the initial input at least is not proportional to, so it's sort of the magnitude or the size of that input, the introduction of the walls. Um, creates this sort of complex um, chain of causal reactions that results in um, changes in the in, in the course of the river. So this is an example of where the output is not proportionate to the input. Um, a relatively small input generates a relatively large, geographically at least, and far-reaching, far-reaching output or change. Um, in the first example, we can say that you know causes can be individually distinguished in terms of linear cause and effect pathways. Um, in a complex system, we can't say that. There's no clear cause-effect path. And while it might be possible, you know, to trace the causal chain uh, in the example of the wolves, it's very difficult to say that, you know, if we were to start by predicting what the consequence of that introduction might be, let's say, it would have been very difficult to predict um, in the absence of, you know, other previous examples or similar comparable examples, 
that the wolves would indeed alter the course of the river and the soil erosion, local flora, fauna, vegetation, and so on. So in systems like this, there is no clear cause-effect pathway. Um, we can reconstruct the causal chain, but it's very, very difficult to make a causal connection from you know one input and then later on the patterns uh, and changes that result from that. And also the fact is that these patterns result from multiple interacting causes. Um, the cause is not the wolves. The cause is you know every element um, in this complex causal chain. So from the wolves to their prey to the vegetation and so on, um, all of these different steps are necessary to understanding um, the causal chain that connects the wolves to the change in the river. So this is what we talk about by patterns resulting from multiple interaction causes. And this is a common feature. This is a feature that's common um, to many change processes in social and ecological systems as well. We need to think about this complexity because it's not always clear that we can predict patterns of change from, um, from simple additives. So the second part of this table then talks about, um, or gives you some examples, um, some real examples, sorry, from, from, di from different scenarios. So if we were to take, say, um, the third part, so in a complex system, we've already said that, you know, structural parts are multifunctional. Some functions can be performed by different parts and single structure models are not valid. What that means, we've already seen examples of this already. Um, when we looked at Ostrom's examples of common pool resource governance, we saw that, you know, there are many, many different ways uh, and many, many different types of uh, governance system. You know, in some cases, uh, ecosystems can be managed by communities, they can be managed by central authorities, they can be managed through laws, they can be, you know, governed by local populations, by customary law that's not, you know, written down or codified in, in common law systems. Uh, fisheries can be managed in different ways, they can be managed by centralised quotas, or they can be managed by, you know, community set seasonal quotas and so on. So we can't always say that, you know, for, you know, regulation in an ecosystem or human system is always performed by, you know, a government or a community or whatever. Um, different ecosystems are governed in different ways, in different contexts, and these change over time. So that's what we mean by structural parts are multifunctional um, and that different, sorry, the same function can be performed by different parts. The final principle then, small inputs can result in disproportionate effects with unintended consequences. Um, we are undergoing, or we're in the middle of you know, one such process right now on both a societal and a planetary scale. Um, a relatively small input has resulted in a very disproportionate um, effect and with unintended consequences. And these consequences are playing out in different ways across the world, depending on the mitigation measures that different governments are taking. So although a relatively small input, you know, in terms of its you know, physical size or whatever, um, you know, the input is relatively small, but the effects um, are, are, are incredibly large, they're unpredictable. And the reason the effects are so unpredictable is because, um, is also because of the human factor, because of, you know, as societies, we respond to feedback, we adapt and so on, and those adaptations don't always work the same way. Um, our circumstances are different from country to country and so on. So um, we can expect uh, many, many different patterns of change and development across the world over the coming, over the coming months. And so one of the principal ways in which um, environmental sociologists or what we might also call human ecologists have tried to incorporate these ideas uh, has been in what's known as the resilience approach. So in the 1970s, um, ecologists working on problems of ecosystem sustainability and management um, were also paying close attention to these developments and debates within, uh, within the systems theory literature. And what we start to see around this time is the incorporation of these different ideas, ideas of nonlinearity and complexity um, into human ecology, environmental sociology, but particularly ecological modeling, the study of how ecosystems behave, behave and change. And so when we talk about or we try and describe change um, in, so in human coupled ecosystems, social ecological systems, um, we have a body of literature and research um, from the resilience approach that incorporates all of these um, theories and ideas and concepts from, um, from complexity science. So this originated in the 1970s um, with an ecologist called Buzz Holling in a famous paper in 1973 where he, introduced, um, where he introduced the term ecological resilience. And he demonstrated this through a, fair, a relatively simple graphic example. On the top of this graph we have what we might refer to as the classical systems approach, but what he refers to as the engineering resilience approach. 
And in the bottom diagram, we've got the, um, the alternative that was proposed by Holling in his 1973 paper, the ecological resilience approach. And his suggestion was this. If we look at how ecologists and sociologists have studied change um, in human systems, ecosystems, and so on, for a long time, they have been concerned with this notion of time. When a system encounters a disturbance, how long does it take for that system to return to return to its base state? So using sort of the ball as an analogy of a system, we'll you know, consider it as a, a society for the moment. And let's imagine we're talking about, say, you know, Irish society in the 1840s, 1850s, the example we looked at in week four. Um, when a system encounters a disturbance that pushes it out of this, you know, ordinarily it might reside somewhere within here, let's say in a state of in a state of stability. When something when 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 when, it, when a disturbance occurs that pushes that system out of its stable state, how long does it take for that system to recover? And this was the classical approach to engineering resilience. How long does it take for a system to recover and return to its base state, to its original state? But ecologists like Holling in the 1970s started to notice a problem with this. And this was a problem that was common to the classical social systems theories that we discussed a couple of slides previous, which was the assumption that systems tend towards you know, just retaining or maintaining their original or their base states. And we know already from the complex adaptive systems literature that this is not necessarily the case, that systems are nonlinear, they're complex, and they change in different ways. And Holling suggested that instead of being concerned with you know, how long does it take for a system to recover, what we should be thinking instead is how much, how much disturbance can a system tolerate? Um, you know, how much can it, you know, to what extent can it adapt to a disturbance um, before uh, those limits are breached and the system undergoes a change before it's pushed into this new state. So this is a profound um, inversion, if you like, of the um, of the approach to measuring and studying resilience. So instead of thinking, you know, how quickly does the system return to the state it was in before, Holling says we should be thinking, well, how much disturbance can a system actually maintain? Can a system actually take? How robust is it to external shocks? How quickly and easily and efficiently can it adapt to change? Can it change its institutions, its behaviors, and so on? Um, and how, you know, to what extent can it do this to avoid um, tipping over into an, 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 an additional state? And, you know, state two can be anything from, you know, radical change to ecological collapse to social collapse or whatever. So at the moment, if we were to think of what's going on in the world um, at present, the engineering resilience approach would be concerned with this notion, with this notion of time. You know, how quickly are we going to overcome, you know, the spread of this pandemic and how quickly is society going to return back to this sort of back to this base state? Uh, but an ecological resilience practitioner would be very concerned with things like, well, you know, what is the state of what are the state of social institutions? Do we have the capacity to mobilize public resources? Can we spend money on additional hospital capacity? Can we invest money in research to study the spread of the disease and so on? Um, can people on a micro level adjust their behavior? Can people confine themselves to their homes, limit their movements and so on? And these are all properties of the system which will determine how much disturbance it can actually withstand. Um, and the simple principle here is that if the resilience of the system is low, it will encounter or experience that, that state transition relatively quickly. So in other words, if our societies are not able to adapt, if we can't um, acquire additional resources, mobilize additional medical aid, if our, the population is unable to self-confine and, you know, an act or perform social isolation, then that, you know, that phase transition or that state transition will be breached relatively quickly. But if our institutions are resilient, if they're adaptive, if we can adapt our behavior, then the system possibly can withstand quite a high degree of disturbance and maintain itself within within this state. So there's a lot of problems with definition about what you know what does state one mean what does state two mean state one could simply be you know high incidence but low mortality state two could be you know high mortality low economic growth rates um, high unemployment and so on so our capacity to maintain within this state if you like will be determined by how robust and adaptive our social institutions are to that so this is the essence of the ecological resilience approach it's very much concerned with these ideas of adaptive capacity can our systems, our social systems, absorb disturbance while retaining their identity? In other words, do we, you know, persist as we are with the same type of economy, the same types of, you know, social relations and so on? Or do we, um, how quickly can we adapt those? It also recognizes that our societies are hierarchically organized. 
Um, we exist within families, communities. Um, people live in countries and sorry, in the you know or country areas versus rural areas versus urban areas. Sorry, um, and those areas will you know have different you know needs, exhibit different properties, different degrees of connectivity, and so on. So the disease dynamics will look quite different, um, depending on where people are located. When, and this can be you know as a result of all sorts of factors. Um, one of the things that's being looked at at the moment. Uh, with respect to the spread of COVID in India is, of course, population density. How do you enact measures of self-isolation self in areas where um, population density is incredibly high? Um, in some regions, of course. And then what's happened or what happened over the course of the 70s and 80s is that this approach was progressively co-opted into the ecosystem management literature so that now today um, we have a body of theory and literature um, that emphasizes not so much this idea of, you know, how quickly do systems recover, but, you know, what are the characteristics of the system? Um, how robust is it to, you know, particular shocks? Is it able to adapt? Is it able to cope? Um, and if so, can it cope um, to the extent that it can maintain itself within this within this state? Or does something else happen? Does the system encounter change? And does it re revert into this into this alternative state over here? Um, as we move through the weeks in this course, we're going to be referring back to the resilience approach more and more because it's quite an important concept um, in terms of what's being written and studied with respect to uh, the climate crisis. So there's quite a lot of emphasis on resilience here. In other words, are our societies equipped to cope with you know, periodic um, climate hazards? Are our institutions adaptable and flexible enough? Can we reach international agreements on mitigation? Can individuals change their consumption patterns? Can we change our you know, travel and connectivity patterns. Can we move from a car dependent society to, you know, a remote working community based society and so on? Can we move from, you know, high consumption, uh, high waste to low consumption, low waste and so on? These are all questions of adaptive capacity and these will determine the resilience of our social systems to um, to climate hazards. But the position also recognizes connectivity and this is the key difference. Um, it recognizes that human systems are ecological systems. We are inextricably linked to our environments. We depend on environmental inputs. We depend on raw materials to persist and so on. And so the resilience approach is a social ecological systems approach. Um, it recognizes that humans are connected with their environments um, at a variety of different scales and levels.